Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's uh, not quite as nice of a day today. I didn't believe there was blue sky in Bavaria in February, but I saw it yesterday. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, cybercrime lines of action, which is, but we're really going to focus on cybercrime, ransomware, and we're very fortunate to have decades of combined experience here in the national security, public safety, and cybersecurity realm. Uh, their bios are all on the papers that you have, so I won't repeat them, and we have short time, so we're going to do dive right in, and I'm going to ask the panelists all to spend about a minute answering the question of what are the current shortfalls <clears throat> in effectively fighting cybercrime right now, and how would you fix them if you could? You know, for, from where I sit, and uh, I've been in the private sector on the vendor side for over 20 years, so spending... Um, literally decades with both public and private sector organizations and companies. Really, I think, from my perspective, it comes down to two things. One, there's uh, a massive technology gap that's uh, still, sadly, very prevalent in organizations, both from a software as well as hardware perspective. And some of the biggest and largest and most critical enterprises in the world today still rely on antiquated hardware and software, and that presents a, you know, a major opportunity for cyber criminals, nation state actors to exploit those vulnerabilities inherent in legacy systems. And um, in absence of a massive forklift of technology upgrades, really what, what we see is a need to fill that gap with effective cybersecurity tools. The other um, important element is I think um, Certainly in the Western world, there is a real lag in, in terms of collaboration and uh, effective cybersecurity policies uh, and legislation in place. And where we see the biggest impact around that is um, uh, a lack of um, carrot in the stick in terms of enforcing proper cybersecurity hygiene, uh, really encouraging collaboration between um, nation, state, and uh, private enterprises as well. So those two large elements are, are what I see. Thank you, Nick. Nick's with an advisor with Sentinel-1 out of Boston. Valerie, following up, same question to you, but let's, um, in addition, what are the cur current shortfalls? Uh, Nick mentioned a stick. Why don't you talk a little bit about what the CISA stick is? <laughs> um, hi, good morning. So CISA isn't a law enforcement agency, but we're an agency that focuses in on how do we understand, manage, and mitigate risks for the nation's critical infrastructure, and especially when it comes to cybersecurity. And as mentioned by Catherine earlier this morning, we have a real concern about small and medium-sized businesses, as well as state and local governments that are, as our director likes to say, target rich but resource poor. Every week um, in the US, we've seen ransomware attacks sadly ongoing against our school systems, against hospitals, and really so from our perspective what we're trying to do is focus in on some of those uh, sectors that do need help. Um, they, they don't have a lot of resources and unfortunately they are um, targets for cyber criminals. And so we've, we, in, at CISA we've launched an initiative to really focus in and help on K-12 through education as well as the health sector and, and the water sector. And we recently released um, a K-12 12 resource guide for educators to help them, to give them a toolkit on things to look for um, to help shore up their cybersecurity. We also have a grant program that we were recently given where we're trying to help our states um, better protect themselves by having cybersecurity plans for their states in order to raise the bar. Really, um, I think we've, we've talked about earlier today, there's probably no way to totally eliminate cybercrime, but it's really our responsibility to make it harder, to make it more expensive for criminals to be able to act. <clears throat> Thank you. And um, Valerie spent years at the FBI uh, before she went to CISA as one of their senior executives. The next panelist, John Carlin, also was at FBI as the chief of staff um, before moving back to DOJ where a, a couple times. So John, why don't you follow up on that? Sure. I, I recently was at uh, the Department of Justice as we did the switch of administration to the Biden administration. And one of the first things I started at, at the Justice Department was a task force focused on ransomware. Uh, as many of you know, I think our, our statistics will show that 2021 was the worst year in history in terms of the damages caused by ransomware actors, criminal and nation state. I think we'll see a, 
decrease in ransomware this year, partly because of the distraction of the criminal groups by the Russian aggression in Ukraine, but we'll see an increase of other types of cyber-enabled fraud, business email compromise schemes in particular. So bottom line, I think the threat picture from bad actors, criminal groups, and nation states is bad and getting worse. Point two would be on the back end, as that problem is getting worse, we continue to see the acceleration of a move now where we've taken everything we value from books and papers, from analog, moved it to digital space, to bits and bytes, connected it through a protocol, the internet protocol, the TCP IP protocol, that was fundamentally designed not to be secure. And I interviewed the, the, those who designed it uh, for a book I wrote on this, and they said explicitly they thought about designing it for security, and since that wasn't the purpose, they designed it so that it would be insecure, which will be a permanent jobs program for my friend from, uh, from Sentinel. When I'm back in private practice now, to, to Mark's pro, uh, uh, question and helping private sector companies then, where are the gaps and what can we do to impact them? One, I know we'll hear more about this here, is we need to be on offense and make it for the criminal groups as painful as possible for them to effectuate their trade. That means doing things like the, the Justice Department just did in cooperation with many countries throughout Europe and private sector companies throughout the world, which is hack the hacker. Do things like, if they steal, the, um, uh, if they steal data, disable the data so they can't use it and post it for profit. If they encrypt your systems, do cyber-enabled operations so that you steal the keys back from the hacker when they try to demand ransom. The, uh, they don't understand why victims aren't paying. This was the Hive case that Brian will talk about more. But secretly, that's because the government is providing all the victims the keys, and so the hacker is out using a tool that doesn't work and doesn't realize it. If they steal, uh, if they get a payment or extortion payment, steal it back, like in Colonial Pipeline, where they're able to recover the digital currency that was taken through wallets. The great thing about blockchain for bad guys is you can uh, anonymously get the initial receipt. The bad thing for bad guys is that blockchain, you can follow the chain and see where the money went, and it is very hard to get it from digital currency into fiat currency and into the pocket of the bad guy. So that creates vulnerabilities for them. If you can't get the money back, disable the wallet so they can't uh, enjoy the proceeds of their theft. If you see where the servers are launching the attacks, seize and disable the servers. This cannot be a unilateral approach. No country can do this. It raises important questions of sovereignty. For it to be effective at the speed and scale of cyber, it's going to take groups like this and the people who are here today working across borders to effectuate these tools at speed. So that's one, go after the bad guy, increase the cost. And the second really is on the victim side of the house of, of both have addressed, which is when I work now, uh, even with the largest companies in the world, because this technology is fundamentally insecure, it means not just focusing on trying to prevent the attack from occurring, but the shift of mindset that we're slowly seeing uh, develop towards resilience. And resilience sometimes means being able to use systems, particularly with critical infrastructure, in a way that is not digitally enabled. I think we've seen actually some success in Ukraine and the resilience of Ukraine against Russian cyber attacks because they are able to operate plants and other facilities manually. In the US, that's an important lesson, I think in Germany as well and across the country, that you sometimes the old-fashioned way works best. This was true with our election, and to have things like in the election context, paper ballots uh, with physical machinery the, the, to maintain the skills and capabilities of operating a plant manually are going to be important to be secure, at least over the next five to 10 years uh, until we innovate our ways out of this. Thank you, John. That was a lot of good info there. The next person, keeping in the FBI theme, was sent over specifically to speak to this group because of his recent leadership on the Hive investigation and takedown. He's the, uh, the FBI's cyber criminal operations lead. Hi, thank you very much, Mark, um, and pleasure to be here. I always, uh, I'm curious, you know, when people get out of 
the government and they're more free to talk about some of these things is how they happen. I just want to make it clear that everything that we John said we did is all with lawful authorities. Um, when we hack the hacker and we steal credentials and things like that, that's based off court orders and the jurisdictions that supervise them. So I just want to make it clear that we're not going rogue on any of you. Um, but if you need a lawyer, I'm here for you. <laughs> The, uh, um, as far as, you know, what do I see out there? And I was trying to keep, because I used to do consulting, so I was trying to keep with the rule of three and I just can't get there. So I'm gonna go with the rule of four. So um, if that sticks, then I'm gonna trademark that thing. Um, so the areas where I think we really need help is on the victim side. So John talked about that. Um, we are only getting about 20% reporting on victims. Um, and we can't do our job and our partners in law enforcement can't do our job if we don't have all the information coming into us. They are just like us. They make mistakes. The more they do things, they leave breadcrumbs, their VPN drops on things, that provides us opportunities to take advantage of. So the more reporting that we get, the better that we are. Um, the second is the private sector. Um, we can't do this. We have great coalitions and great partnerships across the globe that are working these problems. Um, but most of the data, most of the information, and a lot of the capabilities actually resides in the private sector. And so we're having to partner more and more with the private sector. It's not an easy thing, and it's been alluded to up here of based off privacy rules and things that we have in the United States, and I know that are places. We have got to get beyond that if we want to make a real impact on this environment and see a day where we see private sector and law enforcement working hand in hand in the midst of the trenches of these types of things. Um, the, uh, the other part is that from a victim side is looking at this, it's not a technical problem. Um, I was so encouraged earlier when we heard about the thing about, you know, you need process and people and technology. And I think that is so true. These are business systems, and we need to start thinking of this as a business problem. It's not an IT problem that you squirrel away to the guys down in the basement who manage your servers. Um, these systems are there to support our business needs, and so we need to get the business community to get more engaged that this is their problem to help solve, and it's not something that they can just uh, push off to other people. And I'm gonna save the fourth one for another part of my conversation. <clears throat> Thanks. Actually, uh, I'm, I'm going to go right back to you with this next one about uh, if you could just tease out a little bit the importance of international alliances in the cybercrime ransomware fight. I'm going to go to you, but then I'm going to ask CISA to follow up, and then if our other uh, uh, panelists want to jump in, they can before we go to the next question. So uh, maybe use some examples of your most recent if that's uh, yes. appropriate. Yes, yeah. okay. happy to. Um, so certainly within the Hive investigation that we just had uh, the first announcement on, um, so I wanna make it clear that that investigation is not over, um, but that uh, if you look at the uh, uh, press release that we put out there, I think there's 11 different countries uh, that were involved in it, um, as well as Europol as an entity. Um, and that is pretty common. That is almost every single one, I can't think actually, I cannot think of one of our major cases that we have at the FBI that we do not have international partners with, um, and particularly European partners. Um, we were talking last night about those are, are really some of our closest relationships, um, and that comes from uh, you know, where the servers are located, but it also comes from the capability. And so we have to make sure that we're partnered up with entities who have the requisite skill sets to address this. And I'm pleased to report to people in this room that in Europe, you have very capable law enforcement. Um, things where, as we talk about, you know, when we talk about the Hive uh, investigation, it's an example of what we call joint and sequenced operations. And that means that if you look historically at how we did things, it would be you big a big big takedown at the end and you try and get as much as you can within it. And we're recognizing that that model doesn't work anymore. We need to put pressure on the adversary, which means that we need to be doing this on an ongoing basis over a length of time and put pressure on them every day of the week um, because that's what they're doing to us. And so Hive was an example of us and our partners taking those sequenced operations. And you will see things like one country making an announcement on something, and there may not be other countries on there, but that actually may be part of a joint and sequenced operation because we are gonna be timing this over time and let the right place at the right time with the right capabilities address what those issues are. Thanks, and um, 
So FBI has had attachés around the world for decades. Um, CISA is a relatively new agency in that context, so can you speak a little bit about what you're doing to plus up the international coordination for CISA? Yeah, no, for sure. So one thing that CISA, um, if you you are all aware of or not, is that CISA hosts the U.S. CERT team, so the Computer Emergency Readiness Teams, and we interface with over 150 different CERT teams around the country, I mean, sorry, around the world. And that's really the way that we engage internationally. Um, we share information regularly on threats, um, you know, with each other so that we can see if there's a trend going on somewhere else in the world that, that can be shared back and we can share it through that, that CERT network. Um, I want to say too that we team up a lot with the FBI since they have a physical presence. The last time I was at the FBI, I think in over 76 locations around the world. Um, and so even recently in the case where uh, the government of Costa Rica and the governments of Montenegro experienced ransomware attacks, um, FBI was able to have people boots on the ground to help those those countries, but we were able to remotely provide assistance in cases like that. If I could jump in, Mark, I think that's a great example because we had other instances like Montenegro, and then we're partnering with the Germans and the Dutch and bringing their expertise in where we may have one person on the ground, but we've got a, a whole coalition of international partners who are helping out. All right, thanks. Next, um, John, I, I want to go to you, and then I want to go back to Nick on this next one about hacking back since you brought it up. Um, I know Brian clarified it, but what are you, are you saying Wild West? Just, you know, if you see something, do it? Yeah, no, it's, I get this question a lot and understandably because if you're in a circumstance using the Wild West analogy where you don't feel like the government is helping you and that criminal groups where you know the name of the criminal group, you know the location from the IP address of where the attack is coming from. You think you do? It, you think you do, is attacking your company. Can I go hack them back myself and do, can I go get my data back? Can I go disable the data that they have taken? I think for the private sector, uh, as your outside uh, counsel or general counsel will advise, the answer is going to be no, that's not probably a good idea, and that no uh, publicly traded uh, company should be doing that because of the risk. Under US law, uh, there's the Computer Fraud and Abuse, Abuse Act, and it could be a criminal act that you are undertaking when you go to do the attack back. I think there's two reasons why that's really sound policy as well. One that Mark was alluding to is, it sure is hard to get all the attribution right, and the way the criminal groups work is they're often hacking someone to get to you, which means you may be going back against a vic another victim and intruding upon their system. And the secondly, as this group knows and we've been discussing, are the sovereignty issues where that can cause escalation between nation states and that determination as to when the tools of the state should be used in a situation that can cause conflict. To use one example of Colonial Pipeline, you had a criminal group attack a private company in the US for profit and for criminal uh, gain, and that caused a, a oil lines to back up and essentially a national security crisis. That group was located in Russia, and the solution of the, of the state involved statecraft, where the president of the United States raised the issue with his uh, publicly raised the issue with his his counterpart. That said, you can do what's called active defense. It doesn't mean there's nothing that you can do on your system. And so the line I would think about is the perimeter of the, your system or network. You can do creative things like if you know that there's no system that's secure, as we've discussed, and that a bad guy can enter the system, maybe uh, it's a bad idea to put your crown jewels in a folder called crown jewels. Don't advise that. But keep a, keep a folder that says essentially crown jewels and uh, put information in there that is fake. Use a virtual uh, environment so you can monitor the activity of the bad guy on your system. You can also put information in there that they can steal or exfiltrate that will not work when they try to, uh, try to develop it. They'll waste time and resources and you can study them and gives your defenders time to response. And I'm sure uh, Chris can follow up on some, some of these ideas. Finally, and this is in I think a gray space and one that warrants further exploration are things like beaconing back. So if you apply that same principle, bad guy goes into the system, 
take something from your system that they believe to be yours, and it happens to beacon back so that you can find uh, the location. I think that's a, a gray area, and if that doesn't cause damage, maybe uh, lawful. Don't recommend you rush out and do that, but that's one to further explore. And then finally, just to pause, what does that mean, though, go, go, uh, going back to, to earlier comments? If, if companies can't go and defend themselves by doing the attack, it puts even more pressure, I think, on governments and policy regimes to allow effective response by government. Because what can't be sustainable is that you know there's this criminal group attacking you constantly, sometimes with the resource of a nation state, and you on your own as a company are left with nothing to do about it. It means you need uh, to have those partnerships with FBI, Europol, Interpol, others to take action. Thanks, John. Now, can you follow up from the industry standpoint on that? Yeah, you know, Echoing a few things that, that uh, John had mentioned, the vast majority of, of customers in the private sector, um, as well as the pub public sector, emotionally, they would love to be able to hack back. Um, that's not practical. It's not feasible. In most cases, it's not technologically possible. You're either going to end up attacking an, uh, a service provider, an intermediary. Um, and I think what it really underscores is need for collaboration between government law enforcement and the private sector, um, and to leave that element of uh, responding to the experts. But, you know, I think it's best summed up from some of the things I heard yesterday, which for the vast, vast majority of organizations, defense is the best form of offense. So building in resiliency, um, as John had mentioned, building in even deception technologies within uh, your own uh, corporate network, cloaking critical uh, data, and um, building in a modern defense against attacks because attacks are going to happen. Um, as Valerie had mentioned, we're seeing it across, I think, a common misperception from folks outside the industry is that only the most critical and largest companies are hacked. And what we've seen is in a, just an incredible rise of opportunistic ransomware and other types of hacking attacks against libraries, uh, community hospitals, small organizations, tax offices with 30, 40, 50 people, because sadly, they, they, they're going for the weak of the herd. And so, uh, you know, I think it's just incredibly important for these organizations to drive best practice in terms of having a, a really robust defense, but then also really um, game play this out, understand how to respond to attacks, how to collaborate, um, both within their industry and partners. And I think, some of, the, some of the encouraging things I've heard uh, both today and yesterday is really, it, and there is very much a need for increased collaboration and legislation around this, um, because uh, I think a couple of folks up here have mentioned, to date, there's a lot of legislation that actually discourages uh, information sharing in the name of uh, privacy protection, et cetera, and that really hamstrings responding uh, in the proper way to these type of attacks. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Let's, um, let's move more into the geopolitical realm. Um, the, the founder of the Silverado Policy Accelerator, of which I'm uh, a part of, has coined the phrase that we don't have a cyber problem. We have a Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea problem. So John, I want you to put your hat on from uh, your second to last government assignment when you were Assistant Attorney General for National Security Prosecuting State. Uh, affiliated hackers, How, what do we do with criminals supported or tolerated uh, by state actors? Well, can I, I agree fu fundamentally with, uh, with his assessment. These are, for a long time, I think we thought of uh, hackers, and if you ever look at news reports about hacking, it's often the same uh, old B clip, old video clip of a pair of fingers typing on a, a, a keyboard masked in shadow. But the fact is you can put, uh, thanks to incredible work by FBI, Homeland Security, by private sectors, you can put faces and names behind those keyboards. And so in that sense, I think the ransomware criminal problem is, is part of the broader problem of how do we sustain a rules-based order that's under threat as it never has been before in the post-World War II uh, or, uh, regime. And in cyber, as in other areas, actions speak louder than words. I think we've tried for, uh, for years to do this through policy negotiations. But the question, I think, is 
can we work multilaterally in order to impose pain, impose consequences? That can be through the form, just because it's a cyber-enabled attack doesn't mean the response is through cyber. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, remember responding to something we wargamed out for a year, what, what would it look like if a rogue nuclear-armed nation attacked the United States through cyber-enabled means? We always thought it would be on the energy sector or some critical structure. We were surprised when it was about a movie about a bunch of uh, pot-smoking journalists. This is the North Korean attack on Sony motion pictures. So that was not the scenario that we had wargamed, uh, wargamed for. But if we had tried to respond by disabling North Korea's access to the internet, I think there are probably the combined uh, IP addresses and connectivity of the people in this room is greater than the nation state of North Korea, it would not be an effective deterrent. That's why I think you're seeing the use of other tools, lawful tools that could be used multilaterally. Sanc the use of sanctions, um, both against the criminal groups involved, but also the nation states that harbor them, to try to deny them the access to the next cutting edge uh, phase of technology through export controls. I'm going to interview her later at this conference, but the Deputy Attorney General uh, of the United States announced uh, yesterday a new task force with the Commerce uh, Department in the U.S., working with partners across the streets, going after those critical technologies. You heard earlier today from Paul uh, Rosen overseeing foreign investment inside the United States, denying the opportunity through foreign investment from those rogue, uh, from countries that are harboring rogue, rogue actors to next phase technology. A discussion that's quite live today is outbound uh, investment. Should there be rules that limit outbound investment from rules-based countries to countries that are not following the rules to prevent them from developing technologies that can be used for offensive cyber attacks. That approach is sometimes called the all tools uh, approach, meaning all tools, all legally available tools, uh, as Brian uh, pointed out, working multilaterally. And, and just um, before uh, I ask another panelist, just follow up on that. One of the things about the outbound investment is it's not just dollars going to an entity. It can be expertise that goes with that from the venture capital on how to make your business better. And I think the point is we don't want to uh, uh, create uh, any more benefits for adversarial uh, or uh, challenging nations than are already there. Yeah, and, it, it's, and I think it's an, these are important and difficult issues that we need to work through to give, because there's a flip side, right? You, you want to enable those who want to protect themselves from autocratic regimes from getting technology that, for instance, can protect communications. So it's going to take conversations, I think, with particularly transatlantic partners, but really countries throughout the world that share the, the rules-based order on what are the most effective series of sticks that we can use that will ultimately change the behavior of states that are harboring the, these criminal or nation states that are themselves attacking private companies for the benefit of their competitors overseas. Okay, anybody else want to speak on the uh, uh, how to deal with the tolerated state actors? Are we ready to go on? So that was the fourth prong um, that I was, had mentioned earlier, and it's a real difficulty for us um, when you have people in countries that we can't get access to. Uh, you know, we're all getting attacked every day, and there's certain places where this is emanating from. And you know, that's not a law enforcement problem, but that is how do we put pressure on those entities to make it harder for them to continue to do that? And that's an ongoing issue that we need to be addressing. Okay, so, so <clears throat> I'd like to go to you with reporting, victim reporting. Um, do we have any good estimates on victim reporting? What are the trends? Why don't people report and what are we doing? What can we do to facilitate more reporting? I know there's the regulatory side um, for certain critical infrastructure that's going to kick in over a number of years, but can you just kind of run us through where we are with that and then I'd ask um, Nick to jump in on what he's seeing and then if the other panelists have anything they can add. Well, I think Brian mentioned earlier that we have a real dearth, right, in reporting because it's all voluntary right now. Um, we, we were fortunate that in March of uh, 2022, we were able to pass the CERCIA law, so the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure, and we are going through the rulemaking process, as Mark mentioned. So it'll take a few years before we see the fruits of that. But we are really excited um, to be able to, uh, when that law does uh, get enacted, um, to be able to better understand sort of the trends that are going 
going on. And when we think of even about the ransomware issue that we're, we've been discussing here, it's hard for us to, all we know is that the reporting that we have is underreported. So um, what's going on is probably just um, scratching the surface of the of that volume and amount of activity there that's going on. The losses even that have been mentioned in earlier panels are probably even sadly more than um, than have been reported. And so we're, we're really excited about being able to have this data when it comes online and being able to rapidly share it with our um, uh, interagency partners to make sure that we can get um, the intelligence that we glean from the data out um, and be able to really help protect us as um, we've talked about already that really um, hardening our defenses is really an important part of, of being able to, uh, to fight cybercrime. Nick, can you follow up? On yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, it is massively underreported, one in 20, one in 30, or, or greater, and there's several good reasons for that. Um, these are solvable problems, and they need to be solved. The first is uh, most organizations don't know how to go about reporting. They literally don't know what to do next, and uh, what a lot of them are doing is relying on their cyber insurer, which then brings in a breach coach, who, by the way, usually are attorneys, and attorneys are like, don't talk to anyone, you know, the typical legalese, um, and Related to that, I think companies are really concerned about reputational damage, business damage, customer damage, um, and I think that these things need to be addressed and mitigated with legislation and processes where folks and companies can confidentially and easily report, because I think, um, as Valerie had mentioned, there's really good reasons for having that data, uh, just to understand the scope, size, and nature of the problem. Um, but to date, it's, it's really a, a combination of not understanding um, how to do it, getting advice from folks who are, you only report if you have to, and um, I think that's all against the backdrop of the chaos that's usually unfolding during a breach situation. A company is just trying to get back in their feet and uh, go through business resiliency, um, and so that ends up taking a back seat um, you know the the reporting and uh, information sharing aspects. So these are these are things I think we're chipping away at. It's encouraging um, that we're addressing it finally for critical infrastructure. But there's a real need for that to be applied broadly across all industries. Just want to echo what Chris said in terms of of the challenges that private sector companies face, and that some of those challenges are placed there by law and regulation, and highlight a couple parts of that because I think they're very relevant for policy in the EU as they are in, in uh, the US. So one is right now our, our laws are, are skew around privacy. How many of you uh, by show of hands have received a notice at some time that your data was compromised in an incident? So it's pretty much the entire room. I'll tell you, my daughter was a uh, first piece of mail, and she was very excited to see her uh, name. Was a notice that her uh, identity had been stolen in the in a well-known breach of the U.S. government's federal data, uh, databases. So look, I don't think that's a very effective approach. We're all being told I've got you get multiple notices. What are you supposed to do with the notice? Uh, at this point, you just you know that you're. Uh, information has been stolen multiple times. What's more important in a lot of these incidents is that there's a mechanism to get it to the right government officials to act on it and go after the bad guys who took the information. But quite to the contrary, because we have this um, schizophrenic two-sided approach where you have the FBI and some of the other agencies saying, and CISA saying, come in as victims, we're here to help. You have other agencies who are set up to punish the company who is the victim of the attack. If we don't get that carrots and sticks uh, right, I, when we have the internal counsel, they're making rational decisions as private companies why they don't want to go forward. We have to change that. Second, and uh, I'll say this uh, bluntly in this crowd, it is Kafkaesque and absurd that for a period of time there were harsher restrictions on sharing data from Europe to the United States than there were from Europe to, for instance, Russia. How can that be the case? But that is the privacy regime that has been set up on data uh, transfer 
uh, on data transfer between countries. So that means it's quite complicated if you're bringing in Chris or other or trying to work with FBI and you're looking at a breach that is a multinational breach to get the information you need to effectively respond to the attack. So we need to change that uh, incentive as well. And third, you're seeing the move, and just to lift up what Valerie described in the US, for the first time to have mandatory confidential reporting to, to the government. I know private sector is quite worried about that, that it's going to end up being used against them instead of against the bad guy. There's a similar move happening in the EU, and as you, uh, you know, leave and work on the policy on this, I think we all need to work together to try to incentivize that that information is shared for use against the criminals and the bad nation states and not against the victims who are trying to protect the information in the first place. Thank you, John. We have five minutes left, um, and I do want to get to audience questions because I do not want to get a yellow or red card in our football, that means we have to go back five or ten yards and that wouldn't end well. So why don't we go to some audience questions and then we'll, if we have time, we'll go to our last question here. Um, I, if you get a microphone over to one of those gentlemen, please. And a, a question, please, not a, a speech. Thank you very much. Do we have any expectations from the cybercrime convention which is negotiated in the United Nations under the ad hoc committee? Thank you. Uh, any particular, anyone in particular want to, no, not our stuff, you know? I mean, I, that would be more of a question for state, um, so I'm, I'm not sure. If uh, we have a former State Department cyber person in this room that we'll hook you up with um, at, right after Harry's third row on this side. I don't want to put him on the spot, though. I'll do it. A, a two-second <laughs> one, which is, uh, um, it, we'll have uh, them respond later. It's been, as you know, under development for a long period of time. In the interim, I think we need to continue to take action, and some of that action may be through bilateral partnerships, through law enforcement to law enforcement, or cert to cert par uh, uh, partnerships, because it, this is a law of customary uh, law, and so, you, if we don't take action to show that we find unacceptable some of these incursions by nation states through cyber enabled space, we're creating the norm in an international law that says that that's an okay use of your intelligence a uh, apparatus. That's why what the uh, FBI worked with Europol and others do is so important to show even when you can't arrest the individual because it's in a state that will not uh, extradite, that by publicly naming and laying out the facts, taking it out of the shadows in the intelligence world and saying, no, this is unacceptable, just like also customary law and easement. If you let someone walk across your lawn long enough, they earn the legal right to walk across your lawn. It's important collectively that we put up a giant no trespass sign and say that's not acceptable, that's not a norm that we want to live under. Thanks, John. Uh, do you want? Do you have anything to add or should we go to the next audience question? All right, we had another audience question over here. Gentleman with the uh, blue name tag. Thank you. I'm uh, Bernard Kretschmer from NTT. So uh, you talked about the, um, um, the disincentive or almost companies not wanting to report issues, right? And I think one problem is that law enforcement is interested in collecting evidence and the company is interested in getting the systems back up. So law enforcement will probably keep the systems for a while. Would it be an idea to just, as a, as a government, for example, offer an infrastructure to affected companies, trucks with satellite connection, whatever, where you say you can use that infrastructure immediately to be back up and running within days, right? And then we have time to do law enforcement rather than kind of collecting, searching, and holding up getting back into operation. So I'm sorry, what was the question and who was it to? Did you get that, Brian? I can, yeah, I can jump into this. Um, so as far as whether the government, I'm, I'll actually defer on that one, but what I will tell you is that as far as a company reporting, um, and I can only speak for how we respond in the, in, at the FBI, is, and we've had a significant change over this last year, is we need to provide value back to victims. So I came to the FBI because I wanted to do good. Um, and I think you should do the right things for the right reasons. And but I also recognize there's also other competing interests in this, and there's risk for the entities with regulators and things like that. So how do we incentivize people? So we've shifted so that we're going to have value in that first interaction. When you call us, what I will tell you is that we're not taking your servers. We're not taking your, your information. We don't want your data. 
What we want is we want the indicators of compromise. We want to know, the, we want to get the logs. We want to understand the nature of the data because then that helps us understand, well, what are they going to do with it? We don't actually need the data. So we shouldn't be shutting you down in any capacity. Um, the other thing is that we know because how, how we're structured is that when you tell us, hey, it's, it's Hive or it's Lockbit, we've got information on those groups and that agent who shows up on the door or you call on the phone, they can give you right there the, T, the most latest TTPs, the IOCs, whether or not the FBI has the capability of decryption on it, um, any Intel products that we've produced, that is immediately available to you. So that should help you get back up and running so that then we will get the evidence later on on that. But that's the interaction. So we need to speed that up. And Hive taught us that 20%, and some people, and I agree, that may be high, is what reported to the FBI. Brian, thank you so much for that answer. We have, uh, we have no more time left, so I am going to ask and then answer the final question. <laughs> what preventative measures are needed to stop cybercrime happening in the first place? And the answer is none. You can't stop it, so focus on resiliency. All right, thank you for the thank panel. You.